Allah tests those that he loves most and he'll never give us a burden greater than we can handle. And inshallah, after hardship will come ease. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Style Mind. Please enjoy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode. My guest for today doesn't need any introduction. She has been on the show and now she's here again. Mariam Lemo. Good to have you. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. I'm very I'm excited good. you came on the show again. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Jazakillah khair. Always a pleasure. So let us get to the crux of our conversation today. I want to talk about you. Mm -hmm how you found yourself around the dean how you build your iman were you all mashallah sister all for a long time you were so uh all hijabi and the likes of it or was that at a particular time in your life that you were struggling with faith um okay um i grew up in a home where islam was lived everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, my parents were both scholars. Right. Um, my father was even a Sharia court judge mm -hmm. until he retired. And my brother also went down the path. However, I went the opposite direction. <laughs> um, yes, Islam was everywhere. And I think um, sometimes you have certain kids who rebel mm -hmm. and they feel certain things are forced. And um, unfortunately, I actually didn't have a connection with Islam till my mid-twenties. I was told to pray, I prayed. I was told to fast, I fast. Why? I fasted. Why? Because Allah will reward me. Um, the why behind why should I pray, why should I fast, I didn't really dig in. Alhamdulillah, my parents demonstrated Islam in their behavior. So I saw what beautiful Islam was meant to look like. Um, they went out of their way to make sure, especially my mother, that we learned the meaning of the Quran so that we actually know what we are saying. However, I had tuned out. Um, I was in Islamia and my Islamia malam, malams were not correct. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, the whip was used for discipline when we made mistakes. And so connecting the Quran with something beautiful was not really how I, I related mm. to the Quran. I, I related it to pain. I related it to people who were not good in character. I remember one Islamia Malam who would ask us to go and steal salt, sugar, milk from my mother's <laughs> pantry. Um, and imagine he's the one who's supposed to teach us about, you know, the beautiful Quran. So for me, my experience as from a very young age wasn't really a good one. Um, also, society had expectations of me. Mm -hmm. Being the daughter of Sheikh Ahmed Lemu mm -hmm. and Aisha Lemu, I'm supposed to look a certain way, talk a certain way, have a certain kind of friends, um, dress a certain way. And unfortunately, I rebelled. So I chose to make sure they didn't connect me with that. Like I have my own identity. I am their daughter, but I am not them. Mm. And that judging me also came with condemnation because I didn't live up to their expectations. So it made me rebel even more. I really went out of my way to go so far to the opposite end of what they wanted. Mm. Um, childishness, of course, was there, but genuine feeling Islam in me, absolutely not. So whenever my father would travel and he was very strict, I would remove my veil and um, I would wear short skirts. By the time I turned 18, I got married and I moved to the United States. And that was the day I just stopped wearing the hijab for about 10 years. About 10 years? Yeah. I stopped wearing you the hijab. You felt like you were free now to do whatever yeah. you want to do. I just didn't feel like I needed to cover because I didn't have anybody to judge me. Mm. Um, but f I'd say about, um, I started to feel some emptiness inside. At what point? Um, in my mid twenties. Just before we talk about yes. that emptiness, yes. felt, right? <laughs> uh, that ten years when you went back to the US, mm -hmm. right? You were not putting the hijab and everything. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that happened because when you were in Nigeria, you didn't have the proper and a deeper understanding of the religion mm -hmm. from a more uh, commonsensical aspect? Basically, you just told what to do, how to do, and like so. You didn't really feel it in you, so that connection wasn't there. Exactly. I was told, like I said, my parents made a strong effort. Um, we read a day with the prophet every day. Mm -hmm. We sat after we prayed our Fajr prayers. We sit, we discuss, 
but I wasn't listening. <laughs> I just shut down my brother. Um, obviously, you know him to be, um, you know, very knowledgeable about the dean. He was a sponge. He was taking it all in. Whereas for me, I was a blockhead. So I just shut everything to do with um, wanting to even get it at that point. So I had reached a point, but Alhamdulillah, not a point of no return. Mm. Um, however, I still feel that my parents had planted seeds enough mm. that were yet to germinate. And Allah's time is the best. What do you think because you were young at that moment, that's why all these things happen? Or even if you're older, you still had to feel that way? I think if, knowing my personality, mm. um, if I fast forwarded and I was experiencing the same being judged, being condemned, um, if I was, and I am a very stubborn, strong-headed, rebellious person, I think I would have wanted to prove my own identity, even mm. if it was stupid, mm. unfortunately. But, yeah. Amazing. Now, okay, let's go to you in the U.S., right? Okay. Where did you stay in the U.S.? Minnesota. Minnesota. Amazing. Yes. Now, when you went there, you felt free. I can do whatever I want to do now, mashallah. Yeah. Can you tell us, you know, how your life was before you saw the light? Okay, I, as soon as I landed, I wanted to get a job. I wanted to work. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to sit at home doing nothing. Right. So I started to enter the corporate world and I started to climb up the ladder. So of course, it's going to be very hard for you to get a job if, as a Muslim, um, in the corporate world, mm. if you have the Muslim look. And it's a reality that got worse after 9-11 um, when Islamophobia suddenly rose. Sure. However, at that time, I just wanted to fit in. Um, at the time, I was a teenager who was um, very stupid in the sense that I always wanted to be part of a community. Mm -hmm. So my friends, um, we had idle talk. And that was fine by me, even though I came from a very intellectual background. Mm -hmm. um, but because I didn't want them to kick me out of that circle, I did what they did, as stupid as it may have been. So again, in the States, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to look my, like my colleagues. So many of them did not know I was Muslim till years later. But sadly, I had even stopped praying at that time. Wow. Yes. How many years did you stop praying? Um, from the age of 18, about, I'd say six years, five, six years, I five, stopped praying. Years. Yes. So at what point do you realize that there was an emptiness in you and there was a need for you to turn back to your maker? I did start feeling empty inside and I just felt something was missing. I felt incomplete. Hmm. Let me put it that way. I wasn't really happy. Um, even though my marriage was getting better after the sixth, years, uh, sixth year, but deep inside I just felt this hollow emptiness and my brother was doing his masters in Scotland at the time so I reached out to him and I remember I was crying when I called him and said Nuru I have not been praying for five six years and um, I expected him to say oh subhanallah Mariam you're gonna burn in hell and the usual and then he said, Allah is Gafuru Rahim. Allah knows what I've been going through. He knows what triggered these things. It may not be right, but Allah has been with me on this journey. I now said, I prayed to Allah for so many things. He didn't answer me. So I felt Allah didn't care or know that I even existed. And those were amongst the reasons why. And then, of course, the experience I went through. Mm -hmm. So he got me to actually start counting my blessings. He said, do you have this? Um, do you have that? Yeah. Um, do you have this? And, you know, I was like, yes, yes. He said, did you pray for this? I was like, well, not really. I've always had it. He said, but that's Allah's blessing. And he slowly started to get me to actually recognize that Allah has always been by my side. Mm -hmm. I left him, but he didn't leave me um, because he had always provided for me from sources I never expected and provided for me things that I needed that were good for me. And he said, of course, as we know now, I know now that some of the things I was praying for were not good for me at the time. Mm. And Allah's time is the best. And But he gave me something better that I needed at the time. So I started to feel really bad and really guilty. And I thought my brother would say, okay, go back five years and start catching up on your prayers and so on. Um, but he said, just make an effort, Mariam. I know 
prayers are difficult for you, but just do one by one, try your best. And it made it so easy. Mm. Islam didn't look so difficult. Allah didn't look so angry and eager to throw me in hell. Um, and so that subtle approach helped. I know if he had said, go back, start counting how many years of prayers you had missed, start catching up on everything. I don't think I would have continued on that journey. I'm not saying I would have gone to another religion, but I just would have continued the way I was. Mm. So that helped me tremendously. And Alhamdulillah, I, he talked about our mother and how she embraced Islam after exploring various religions. And he said for her, Islam made sense to her logic. It mm. answered those questions that she didn't understand when she researched other faiths. So I then called her and started asking her questions, things that confused me, right. um, you know, things like, why do good people suffer? Why do innocent children who have committed no sin, why are they born with cancer, you know, and they eventually die, leukemia, things they, like what, what trial is that? How am I supposed to have Iman and understand that, you know, there is a lesson, there is a, um, a message from Allah in what everything that we see. Mm. Um, and then my mom also, she has a beautiful connection with nature. Right. So she got me to really, and she always had, we've always had this in us, but just each time I look up at the sky, each time I look at the plants and the butterflies and insects, I should feel the majesty, the awe of Allah's creation. Wow. So I'll tell you a quick story. I right. remember sitting in the garden one day and a little caterpillar fell down on the floor. And then I watched these ants come. One touched it, the caterpillar wriggled, and the ant went back. Next thing I saw, a gazillion ants come. And they overpowered this caterpillar, picked it up, and took it back to their nest. And I was like, wow. So this was divine design, that these ants would have their meal for this with this caterpillar, but this caterpillar was created to serve Mm. not just to exist, but everything has a purpose on this earth. So for me, I found that comforting. Another experience was I was sitting and a leaf fell on my lap. Then I went back and I remembered the verse in the Quran where it says, and not a leaf falls that he does not know. And I just looked around me and I was like, look at the uncountable gazillion leaves that are on the ground, but this is here where I am. But there's a tree there and a tree there and a tree in China, in India, and the leaves are falling. And you're telling me Allah knows each leaf that falls. Again, connecting things with nature and realizing everything is a grand design, divine design, and nothing happens by accident. That's so, really amazing. Alhamdulillah, That's it's, really amazing. it's those little things for me that started to really bring me comfort and started to make me connect. And then I started to speak to my dad slowly. And my dad is Konk Maliki, so he's more strict and follow rules and so on, which is part of what made me rebel. So, but I started to talk to him and Alhamdulillah, he started giving me du'as to recite and certain du'as he said, you, would, you, will, you will witness miracles. Because I always say, Allah, please show me a sign. Show me a sign that you are there, that you are hearing me. I just needed that conviction. And it was so simple. I was my dad. I was traveling um, to visit Nigeria for the first time after I got married um, in 95, 1995. And I remember my dad, um, I was stranded in um, Amsterdam. And I told my dad that they said, I don't have a transit visa. At that time, I didn't have my British passport. Right. So I was going to be sent back to the US. And I was devastated because I had not seen my parents or my family since I got married. And my dad, when I called him crying, he said, just say la ilaha illallah as many times. He said, Mariam, thousands of times, just keep saying la ilaha illallah. So they took my passport, told me to come back the next day. They'll have a new ticket issued for me to go back to the States. So I cried, stayed in a transit hotel, came back the next morning. And then they said, I have to go back. The lady who was being very disrespectful, very aggressive in how she spoke, I just kept saying la ilaha illallah. Tears were rolling down my face, but in my heart I kept saying it. Then this other lady just walked up and said, what's going on? And I explained everything to her. And then I saw them both go into a room. It was a glass room, so I could see it like a quarrel going on. And then the woman now came back after like an hour. She handed me my passport and a ticket. And she said, you may proceed on your journey to Nigeria. And 
that day well i i just felt okay allah thank you <laughs> Allah, I, Allah. I believe now. Mm. When I reached home, I told my dad the experience and we're no pay. So he said, Watamio, which is <laughs> you talk through, you know, something <laughs> like that. And so that. <laughs> yes. And it was so beautiful. And from then I just kept going. I became hungry to learn more and to connect more. That's so. really amazing. <laughs> you just made me remember the verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, you know, if you're careful of Allah, if you fear Allah, meaning, you know, you understand that Allah is watching whatever you do, you recognize the fact that even if you sin, you go back to Him. Yeah. Allah said, I'm going to make a way for you where exactly. there is no way. Exactly. And I will enrich you from means you never, ever anticipated. Expected. Absolutely. And, you know, for me, I think uh, my connection with Allah, I think a lot of people look at Allah as, okay, He's not there, so I was, was going to ask him, yeah, do it or don't do it, right? But I think it's way too spiritual. You have to build that connection, connection. with your maker. Like yeah. for you, what mm -hmm. really happened around you was the nature you had. You know, you were looking at the leaves, how they're yeah. falling down. You know, the ants with the caterpillar and like so. So exactly. these are amazing things that I think a lot of people need to find ways to connect Absolutely. with their maker around the sunnah of the Prophet yeah. you, made, you made mention of something very important about your mother. May Allah have mercy on her. Uh, <laughs> and may Allah make you all the kid the coolness of her eyes. Uh, yeah. uh, you said that you asked her a question, right? Mm. About why do bad things happen <laughs> to good people? Mm. Can you remember what she said to you? I talked to several people about this because mm. it's something that, you know, sometimes you do get to understand. There are some things as just mere mortals you mm. won't get. And there are some things that we will never truly understand. However, the fact that whatever trial whatever adversity, whatever challenge we go through in life, that it is us on trial. Our whole life is, a, is an exam that we are actually preparing for. And every experience, good or bad, is a test from Allah. Wow. People may be going through divorce, may have lost a loved one, may have been diagnosed with a terminal illness or their children are diagnosed with a terminal illness. A woman may have carried a child for nine months and then the baby is stillborn. Um, people are going through, their children are hooked on drugs and so on. All these are actually tests from Allah. One of two things, based on the little I have learnt, and I'll come back to your question. The first one is either you have done something wrong and Allah is actually punishing you for what you have done wrong. I may have slandered you. I may have lied. I may have gossiped. I may have committed zina. And now I am going through the consequences of my actions. Or I actually didn't do anything wrong. I didn't kill an ant or a fly. However, Allah is giving me this trial to test my faith, mm. to test whether I will turn away from him or get closer to him in time of adversity. Mm. He says in Surah Al-Baqarah, and most certainly we shall try you. Not maybe or one day, no. And most certainly we shall try, uh, try you by means of danger, hunger, loss of your worldly goods, of lives and of the fruits of your labor. So if you think about that, of lives, you're going to lose your loved ones. Most certainly, I will try you. So all these experiences that we perceive as negative, as bad, are actually Allah fulfilling a prophecy that most certainly we shall try you. But give glad tidings to those who are patient in adversity, whom when calamity befalls them, they say from Allah we came and to him is our return. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. For me, I have actually gotten to understand because this is one of the things my mother explained to me, that these tests, these challenges will always occur. They will always happen in life. However, Allah has put me on trial and the way I'm going to have to read hard for my YAC exams, my GCE exams and so on, I stay up at night, I do my homework, I research, I try to make sure I'm going to give the examiner the best answers so that I ace that test. She said that's how you are supposed to behave during that time. Most often when we go through hardship, we are like, oh Allah, why me? And I say, why not you? Who do you suggest? Mm. Like, you know, it is natural that natural human instinct to feel like a victim, to feel it's me that is suffering, mm -hmm. whereas it's actually Allah testing me and Allah tests only those that he loves most. I love that. This is something my brother said to me. 
Allah tests those that he loves most and he'll never give us a burden greater than we can handle. And inshallah, after hardship will come ease. So all those things are things for me that I quickly connect. When I lose a loved one, I was going to lose my mother. Allah was kind enough to give me seven year notice that she's going to go in the sense that she had um, Parkinson's. Uh, was, yeah, she was first diagnosed with dementia. Eventually that became Alzheimer's. She also was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. I think you remember Muhammad Ali, yeah. where the body shakes. Mm -hmm. Slowly that suffocates and constricts you where you can't breathe anymore. So, but Allah was kind and merciful enough to give us that. However, as much as I saw her going through the difficulties of losing her memory and the fear that one day she won't know who I am, I continued to look for light in everything and look for the beauty in how Allah actually gave us notice, number one. For me, I felt that was a blessing. Allah gave us a chance to say goodbye. It gave her, because her memory was fading slowly, a chance to hand over the baton to us the right way. So that during her lifetime, my brother and I were able to pick what she had started with my father as well, Alayr Hamu, and continue their legacy. But before they died, the fact that both of us heard our parents say how proud they are of what we have become, but most importantly, how we've taken the organization that they established beyond what they ever envisaged it to be. For me, that was something that was so beautiful that we got to hear them say that before Allah called them home. So that was a source of comfort and peace for us. And again, a source of looking for the blessings in the trial. The same thing with my father. He passed away from COVID, Alayr Hamu. Mm -hmm. And COVID um, can be nasty again um, because you have breathing difficulties and this and that. But again, we got to say goodbye properly. We got to see him go with grace, with dignity. And my mother was in a coma for about two weeks, but wallahi, alhamdulillah, when the last minute, the last hours came of her life and we saw the doctor and alhamdulillah, they both passed away at home. We saw the doctor struggling to find a vein and so on. I was like, Allah was merciful to put her in a coma so she didn't feel the pain, so, you know? So it's always seeing the trial, but again, having that faith in Iman to say, this is actually Rahma. This is mercy. You may lose a child and why do innocent? Like, especially the one of a child that was born still and a woman went through nine months um, and you don't know what Allah is protecting you from. Maybe that child would have been a source of fit enough for you or for the world. Again, you just go back to stories of others during the time of the Prophet وسلم, and refer back to them. And not just Rasulullah, but other prophets. You think about Musa alayhi salam, and he believing he is the most wise. And yet Angel Gabriel appears to say, no, there is one wiser than you. He immediately repented to Allah for saying that, but he wanted to go on that journey. And you know where this man, where, um, it was Kidr. He went on a journey with, right? Yes. Right. And he Kidr. killed a child. And of course, Musa alayhi salam is like, how can you be so cruel to kill this child? But this child would have been a fitna for his parents and society in the future. So there's always light if you look for it, but you have to make sure you don't ever see yourself as a victim. Never ask why me, say Alhamdulillah, and then ask Allah, what am I supposed to learn from this? Allah, please show me and give me the strength and the courage and the faith the taqwa to be able to pass your test in the right way. For me, that's what works for me. <laughs> wow, this is yeah. so much to take in and wow. Can um, I say something? Yeah, well, please. Go <laughs> Sorry, ahead, I know please, I talk too much. Please, please. Um, I wanted to say something about also what my brother said that time, mm -hmm. um, because I remember saying, Nuru, I feel I am a lost cause. I feel I have sinned, not sinned by committing crimes, not sinned by doing bad things, but just leaving Allah for so long and not praying and so on. Um, and I remember, wallahi, this thing made me, I cried profusely when he said this. He said, as many times as you sin, there is a hadith where the Sahaba was sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he, they, um, he was speaking to them about how huge how hot, how massive the fire of Jahannama is. But he asked them, do you know what will put that fire out? He said, one tear, one tear of a sincere istighfar. And that sincerity for me, like genuinely Allah, I am sorry, I have gone astray. 
Some people see themselves as a lost cause. They've committed the zina, they have left Allah's side, they've done bad things, they've cheated people, they've um, hurt orphans, done bad things. But the moment you are intentional and you make a conscious decision that I want to start afresh, Allah will always be there because one tear, as long as you are sincere, as many times as you keep committing these offenses, if you repent and you are genuine, but not the 419 repentance. What I mean by that is I know some people, they'll do terrible things. Then they'll say, oh, I'm going for Hajj and I'll, I'll wipe away my sins. Then I'll come back and start all over. Not that kind of 419 um, <laughs> sinner, but genuine, sincere repentance. Allah, I slipped again. Allah, I'm sorry. Allah, please give me the ability to fight my nafs so I don't repeat this. That genuine one, I love that. Allah is that forgiving and that merciful. And he is eager for us to ask him to forgive us. And he wants us to be confident and optimistic. Once we do, let it go, inshallah, he has accepted it. Wow, this is <laughs> so amazing. And just before we go on a short break, inshallah, uh, when you talk about test, right, a verse came to my mind. And uh, you know, yes, we believe, and you brought the verse in the in Surah Baqarah to talk about certainly you will be tested. Yeah. And there's a verse in the second verse of Surah Ankabut where Allah is saying that, uh, and do you think because you say you believe we shall not test you, yes, won't test you, we've exactly. tested those before you? And that when you know, at some time when I go through some problems in my life, I'll be like, okay, am I still a believer? Yes, I'm still a believer. Okay, Allah already says I'm going to go through this test, and then it comforts exactly. me a lot. Yeah. Now, on the next thing I want to comment on is what you said about Allah forgiving your sins. And how you know one tear for the sake of the one that has made you can go a long way yeah. and you know every day Allah speaks to us in the Quran but it's as if we are not listening to those powerful words of his yeah. right where Allah subhanahu says in the Quran he said tell my servant right when they trans, you didn't even say if you say when they transgress, transgress upon us. themselves, exactly. they should never ever lose hope in the yeah. mercy of Allah. So, I think there's a need for us to really know Allah, yeah. know His words, mm -hmm. and it's gonna, it's gonna really help Absolutely. us. So, we're gonna take a short break <laughs> and we'll be right back. Sounds good. All right, viewers, stay tuned, don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Style Mind is the home for Scandinavian and European interiors. If you are looking for the best minimalistic home design, Style Mind make it easy for you to shop in style. Follow Style Mind on Instagram at stylemind.ng. All right, welcome back. Alhamdulillah, we have been discussing with Maryam Lemo. May Allah bless her. We've been talking about her life and faith, how she found Islam, and we're just going to continue on that now. Welcome back, Maryam. Thank you very like much. Like well, yeah. uh, so my next question is this, right? So many people think that to attain spirituality, you need to forget how human you are. And then it takes them away from the deen entirely. What do you think about this? Hmm. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I think where there's a huge misconception, and one thing I've, ob ob I've observed in a lot of Muslims, is they wear religion like a uniform. Hmm. They put it on when it's convenient and take it off when it's not. Um, we've heard that Islam, we've heard this, it's been said forever. Islam is a way of life. Sharia is a way of life. Sharia, those laws, those injunctions by Allah cover every aspect. There is nothing left. When we see way of life, it's the way we sit, the way we talk, the way we treat our neighbors. This is life. Um, you know, how we relate with people, how we, our work ethics, it's, a way, it's life. It's real life. It's not separated from religion. So you notice, you notice, of course, during as Ramadan gets closer, everybody is rushing to arrange themselves, you know, so that they are ready to be more spiritual, more pious. Um, whereas that spirit of Ramadan is meant to be sustained for the rest of our lives. Um, they say, don't lie, don't cheat don't do this don't do that and you find muslims are more conscious oh i can't gossip i'm fasting oh i can't do this i'm fasting um i'm i'm fasting so i'll abstain from zina during the month of ramadan like what 
It's not something you can put on or take off. What I love is the simplicity. People say Sharia, and it sounds like this fanatical extreme, like when you say you follow the Sharia, it's like it actually makes things simpler. It makes life easier. It's protecting us. When the law of Allah says don't drink alcohol, we all know what alcohol can do. So again, during Ramadan, we don't drink the alcohol. We, don't, we try to refrain from smoking during the day for some people, and then after they break their fast, they continue. But again, they reduce it compared to after Ramadan, it's back to full pack or whatever it is. So for me, what I love about the simplicity is it helps protect, do not sleep around, do not sleep with anyone other, anyone other than your spouse. What has science proven is that people who, for instance, commit zina, um, um, promiscuity, it makes it so hard for them to ever appreciate that one that Allah has witnessed, where Allah has put his stamp on to say, yes, this is your legal spouse. Um, it makes you compare. You will never be content if you break away. So what is it doing? It's protecting your mind because the devil will go to work and keep you busy um, breaking Allah's laws. The same thing again with alcohol, drugs, anything that can hurt you, Allah says, don't take it. Even pork, we are told not to eat pork. People wonder like, what's the big deal? But science has proven what pork will do to your body. Um, it's so many things. Anytime Allah says something is bad for you, it's because he's trying to protect you. Not he's trying to make life miserable for you or he's trying to um, make your life boring. Um, people will say, let's go to parties. Let's, you know, if it's not a halal party as in separated gender, gender, the devil will go to work. And before you know it, you'll see somebody, maybe they're dancing and you find them attractive and one thing will lead to another. So this thing about Islam is a way of life. It's just a lifestyle do good, be kind, be polite, um, be respectful, don't be greedy. If you overeat, you will get fat, you will get health issues. Like all these things are written down as law. You follow them, wallahi, life is actually easier. So it's not something that we can pick and choose and nitpick which one we want to live and practice. That's why Allah has given us an example in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi a model for us to see the walking Quran and we are meant to emulate it. I get so deeply concerned um, with Muslims who focus so much on hadda. You know, many people, they just want their kids to, you know, memorize the Quran and show off that, oh, my child is a hafiz of the Quran and so on. But at the end of the day, if they don't know what it means, how do they get the message from Allah? How do they learn what is in this beautiful book? So yes, there's a lot of reward in reading the Quran and memorizing it. But at the end of the day, if you've memorized, but you don't know what the heck you're saying, it's like, what have you accomplished? You do need to get the message. That's the whole purpose of the book. And if Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his last sermon said, it is his hope that the Ummah, generations after he is gone, learn and practice the faith better than those who witnessed it, his Sahaba, live and direct, then Fast forward to 1400 years later, let's look at today and say, are we practicing Islam better than the Sahaba? There's a lot of work to do because where we have a problem is religion is a uniform and it's the symbols we focus on. Oh, I've got the Sunnah gemu and the Sunnah trousers, the Sunnah look, but not the Sunnah way. Hmm. And for me, that is of deep concern. So on my journey to discovering Islam, that's why I tell everybody I'm not a scholar, I'm a student. Each day I learn and grow, but every single day, wallahi, I read the meaning of the Quran, every day. And like I remember in a talk by Mufti Menk recently where he said, even if it is just one verse, from one verse it will move, graduate to two verses, to a chapter, to three chapters. Do as little as you can, but make it a habit, mm. because that Quran will be your witness. And what will that Quran say you did with it? Did you demonstrate what you learned from it? Did you practice what you were asked to do? And at the end of the day, if the Quran is going to speak to Allah, oh my God, I want to make sure Allah hears that I treated that Quran, not just I put it on a shelf and it looked good, or I looked the look, but 
I actually went the path on the Sarat al mustaqim mm. That is my prayer that, you know, more will recognize that's what Islam is about. It's just a lifestyle. Carry yourself with dignity. Um, dress modestly so as not to let shaitan do you a suisu in people's ears and create some kind of fitna for you. Um, don't gossip, don't slander, don't cheat, don't lie, don't steal. Um, respect time. I mean, it's about manners. It's about good adab. So it's a lifestyle. It's not, oh, I become boring when I become pious, when I become more spiritual. No, it's in my breathing. Mm. Every breath I take should be part of Islam, doing it the right way. Yeah, that's really amazing. And and I think you know the Prophet ﷺ used to say that uh, he who supersedes in character has supersedes in, in religion. Absolutely. And then go to my next question. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in a generation where sin has become so pervasive and invasive. I mean, if, even for the righteous ones, they find it difficult to stick on the path sometimes. And when they do a particular thing, they become so regretful, they feel so bad. And some people, it goes even as far as stopping them from doing the good work that they are doing. Yeah. And a lot of young people find themselves in this kind of situation. Uh, I'm a young person and uh, I'm below 30. So there's so much temptation going on around my community. Uh, you know, things are happening. I want to do it. I want to experience that. I want to experience this and like something. What advice do you have for young adults like myself who are coming into the, the world now, understanding the world in a different perspective? You see, good character is universal. Good is good, bad is bad. That one is in black and white. But anywhere around the world you go, if you maintain a certain standard for yourself, and I love that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, all Muslims should demonstrate itqan and ihsan in, ihsan in everything they do. Perfection and excellence. If that is your code of conduct that you set for yourself, so excellence in your prayers, perfection in your ablution, to the best of your human ability, then professionalism in where you work, meaning you're punctual, you never break the laws, like the cheating, embezzlement, stealing, mm. shortcutting, shortchanging, blah, blah, blah. And you, know, you are constantly remembering Allah. That taqwa, you wear it. And that's the key thing that superiority in the eyes of Allah, as he says in Surah Al-Hujurah, is not based on gender. It's based on piety. It's based on our taqwa, our knowledge, our constant remembrance of him. And if we always, however young you are and however old you are, this is just as a human, you always have your qibla, you're facing the right qibla mm. in your character. Like, I won't do wrong deliberately. I will make sure I do the right thing always, even when I don't feel like it, then you have nothing to be worried about. It's not something that will ever go out of fashion. Mm -hmm. So for you to live by that standard of itkan and ihsan in everything you do, no, you will always win. And at the end of the day, regardless of your age, where are you going back to? Where did we come from and where will we end up? Mm -hmm. If not, why do you pray? if it's not because you know you're gonna go face your maker at the end of the day. So if you know that, and why do you fast? Again, because you, want, you know you're gonna go back to your maker. So if you've agreed that I gotta fast, I gotta pray. If you do nothing else, then that means deep in you, you know you're gonna go and account for what you did on this earth. Then do it the right way. Don't say, oh, I just want to rock life and have fun. When I grow older, I will be more dignified. When I grow older, I will settle down. I will stop the booze. I'll stop the smoking and the shisha and the whatever. whatever. It's a way of life. It is a standard you set for yourself. And you will always go far in life as long as you make sure that you're facing the right ibla in your character, in the choices of people you put around you. These. The influence of social media, I think, is one of the biggest problems that we Muslims are facing today because we are importing cultures and culture now supersedes religion and it's diluting our religion. And unfortunately, I think, um, you know, pop culture is something that the youth always want to be part of. You know, we want to be part of the happening folks, you know, so nobody looks at us and say, oh, we are boring and so on. But you don't have to be like everybody else. Mm. Um, at the end of the day, uh, there's no guarantee that um, the coolest guy is going to go to Jannah or hell. But just make sure you always, always do the right thing, even when you don't feel like it. But you can be fashionable. I love fashion, actually. Um, and I know many people criticize me and say I'm not 
Muslim enough because of my dressing, but I say that's between me and my Lord, and I'm still on a journey, and Allah's time is the best. However, I keep telling people, you know, if you want to look good, look good, just make sure it's modest. Mm. If you want to enjoy the luxuries, the big cars, the big house, go ahead and do so, but what else do you do with your life and what else do you do with your money? Make sure it is also useful to others. Make sure you are the best at being the most useful. Mm. And then there's nothing wrong with that. It's not, oh, I want to enjoy all of this dunya. And it's not a sin to enjoy your wealth, but just make sure you do as Allah wants you to do. Be equitable in distributing it and know it's, it came from Allah and know he can take it all away in a, in a blink of an eye. So never take anything for granted. Mm. Yeah. You know, just before we go to my next question, just sit on this. Uh, what would you say to the young people out there yeah. who are already going through a lot in their lives in times of sin? However, they want to go back to the America, they want to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, they find it a bit difficult. What do you say should be the first thing for them to do? Number one is remember, of course, the hadith where um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described how big the fire of Jahannam is and how hot, but he told the Sahaba that what can put that fire out is one tear of a sincere istighfar. Mm. So comfort yourself in knowing that. And as Allah has said, even in the Quran, I can't remember what verse where he said, oh, you who have sinned against yourselves, you know, again, he's giving us comfort that you've gone astray, you've sinned upon sinned, but have comfort that he is Gafur Rahim, he is ever forgiving. Mm. Be sincere in your intention and be intentional in wanting to change mm. and wanting to turn over a new leaf or turn a new chapter in your life and turn towards Allah. It is often what I address, uh, what I say is the Quran was revealed over so many years because had it just come, boom, it would be hard for people to accept it in that way. However, change comes and happens slowly. Mm. Just like habits, good habits develop slowly, bad habits de develop slowly. The same thing applies to our discovering Islam and turning to Allah, one step at a time. Just mm. be conscious, be intentional, make sure you do one thing each day that is different from what you did the day before. Mm. Always add one more. If you did um, nafila, just two rakahs of nafila, um, you may choose to add another one. Or if you did this zikr, add about another five minutes of it. If you read this verse or this, yes, just this line, add another line. It's step at a time because as with each step we take towards Allah, Allah will come first, furthest toward, uh, faster towards us. So it's about that. Again, the luxuries of technology today have allowed us to always keep Allah in the top of our minds. Mm. So for me in my phone, I have apps that pop up with a hadith during the day. When I read it, I remember my maker and I remember Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then remember each time you pray, each time you pray, you've got five daily prayers, um, obligatory prayers during the day. At least no less than 16 times in the day we keep as asking Allah when we recite Fat Surat Al-Fatiha to guide us on the straight path. Oh, sure. So if we pray our Subu prayer, between Subu and Zuhur, we have a period of time of a few hours. And then by Zuhur time, we're going to recite that Fatiha again. Are we intentional as we're reciting, Allah guide me on the straight path or after my Salam Salam, I get up and I sin. Then I come back and I say, Allah guide me on the straight path. It doesn't work that way. You have to be conscious of what you're saying. Mm. That's why understanding the meaning of the Quran for me is really critical. We need to make it mainstream. It should be in schools as part of the curriculum. It should be part of what parents do is put them together, learn the Quran, learn the meaning of it mm. so that you understand what are the expectations of you as, as a Muslim and what are the stories, what are the lessons to be learned. So for me, I think um, use technology as a wonderful tool. When I go on apps like Instagram, I have many hadiths that I follow, many sites that give hadiths and quotes or verses of the Quran or give lectures, mini, mini, one minute lectures. They just constantly come up during the day and remind me of where I want to go. And my journey continues of learning. And for me, I think that's something that we can do to be intentional, deliberate, let mm. nothing happen by accident. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, you spoke about habits. So this is going to be my last question, inshallah. Uh, speaking about habit, you say it grows day by day and likes of it. 
there's an issue or a particular sin that so many people from the young to the old, from the men to the women that so many people are addicted to mm -hmm. and this is pornography, right? What do you think is the way out of this problem? Because it's a problem that's happening in our society. Mm -hmm. Even if we choose to keep a blank eye to it, it's happening in marriages, it's ruining marriages and likes of it. Uh, young people get married, that is not what they were expecting because they're used to watching a particular sin. What do you have to say about this? And we'll end with this. Okay. Um, definitely, um, pornography is destroying marriages today. It's destroying lives. Even if you're not married, um, just addiction to pornography, um, it creates a lot of insecurities in a person. Psychologically, it actually makes you find yourself disgusting. Because, of course, once you look at pornography, you're more inclined to go and um, into masturbation. So it's like you must release because you've gotten yourself all excited with these fantasies. So there has to be an out and the out is also another monster. So these are two, it's like a double-edged sword. Um, I think one of the things is being intentional. Number one, know that yes, fitting, I will be everywhere. There will always be triggers. Recognize your weaknesses because once you know where your weaknesses lie, that actually now becomes your strength because you need to make sure if one of the weaknesses is seeing maybe sexy girls on TV, then be very conscious that something can pop up and stimulate the thoughts which could lead you one thing to another mm. to go look into it. Watch what you watch, whether it's on TV or on your phone, the apps you follow, the sites you visit. Why? Because the algorithm has been designed in such a way that the moment you spend a few split seconds looking at something, the system automatically programs and keeps sending you things that you didn't even ask for. It's been designed to destroy us. Let me just put it that way, unfortunately, because good is no longer cool and bad is the status quo today. So the way they have designed it is in a way that it's meant to suck you in even more. And so don't be stupid, don't be you know, shooting in the dark. Don't be so blind and don't make yourself a soft target. You have to be conscious. You need to delete things that will stimulate the thoughts. Make sure you stop going on those sites and then get rid of all the cookies because the cookies remember where you've been for at least, I think, about 90 days. So wherever you go, there's a digital footprint you've left behind because that is the thing today. We have an opportunity to commit sins in privacy. Before we had the internet, you have to go buy maybe a cassette of a pornography movie, put it in the TV, and of course the TV, somebody could walk in the room. You have this, you can be anywhere. You can be in your car, you can be in the bathroom. And so don't make it easy for yourself. Watch what you watch, watch what you listen to, watch what you read, because there are so many things that stimulate fantasies in our minds that push us to go and carry certain things out. So you have to be careful. The problem with pornography is many people don't realize what you're looking at are paid actors. Mm. These are people who are professional. The way you have um, a professional banker, you have professional porn stars who have practiced take one, take two. They have practiced these stunts and these acrobatics they do. They get paid for it. However, what you don't see are the bloopers. You don't see what falls on the editing floor. You don't see the poop. I'm sorry, these are realities. You don't see when they fart. You don't hear when they fart. They cut all that crap out. And so what you see is something packaged, polished, with the soft music in the background and everything. Then you have expectations. Then you think your partner for life should be able to do all those things. They should be follow come with all these skills. And then disappointment. You see somebody who, let me, you, I, I don't mean to be X-rated and so on, but for instance, a lot of male porn stars actually are encouraged to ejaculate first before they start. So they now take things like Viagra and things to keep them with a long erection. And then you suddenly go to your wife who maybe has seen pornography and she finds within one, two minutes you're done and she's disappointed. Why? Because she has expectations. But the same thing for the men. A man now sees pornography and finds, I'm not able to do that. What's wrong with me? It affects your self-esteem. It just has a domino effect that just destroys a person. And like I said, the worst is the self-loathing, the guilt. You actually find a lot of people start to hurt themselves 
by doing this thing. And again, because pornography leads to masturbation, for men, you've got premature e ejaculation, watery semen, a whole bunch of things that happen that will damage your marriage, damage your relationship. And at the end of the day, it's not worth it. So most important advice is know the triggers and then delete them and make sure you don't ever put yourself or expose yourself to those things that will tempt you to go back and then pray hard. Pray hard and ask Allah to help you with this challenge you're facing, with this trial, because it is a trial, and just constantly, constantly tell yourself, I'm stopping and keep repenting, because it is haram. May Allah guide us all. Wow, I mean, Ya Rab, Jazakillah Khair, thank you so much. Uh, your academy, uh, it's a premarital class where people come to learn about, you know, things that would expect in marriage like of it. Where can people go to get access to this? The Marriage Academy um, does marriage and premarital mm. um, counseling and tips. So it is a virtual school academy because we want to make sure people have access to it anywhere around the world. Right. Alhamdulillah. So I created a 72 video premarital masterclass for those who want to get married, those who want to learn the skills and tools needed to navigate the obstacles that exist mm. in marriage, and then hopefully learn tips on how to make their marriage work and thrive. So it's on my website, mariamlemu.com, okay. www.mariamlemu.com. So they can visit the site and just register for the course. Mm. And if they can't afford it, they can also apply for scholarship, which oh, really? is also available. Yes, um, yes. And then some people who want to do it as a Sadaka Tunjaria, contact us and want to donate so that if people want to benefit from that to take the course, it becomes, inshallah, an act of sadaka for them. Amazing. Thank you yes. so, so much for being on the program. Okay. Mama Sheikh. <laughs> Jazakillah khaira. Thank it's you so pleasure. much. It's a pleasure. All right, there, viewers. Alhamdulillah, we've come to the end of this episode. You, you've known what you need to know. We ask Allah that we, he makes us of those who listen and implement whatever we've heard. And if whatever problem you're going through, whatever addiction you're going through, don't feel depressed. Don't feel that ah, you're out of the hook. You know, you're gone. Just find a direction, find a way to help yourself, and you will find Allah there to help you. I'll leave you on the care of the most gracious, the most merciful. Until the next episode, stay safe.